uh, to back to Amanda. And if you would read for us, Amanda, this morning's passage from Isaiah, not second Isaiah, just up there. <laughs> uh, this morning's first lesson is from Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10 through 62, verse 3. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My whole being shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots and as the garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. Thank you, Amanda. We're gonna follow this passage is coupled in the lectionary this week the reading from Galatians chapter four. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman and born under the law in order to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent his spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so that you no longer are a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. These two passages have a, a, a bit in common. They share with each other this notion of identity, who we are. Uh, and we see it uh, as declared in Isaiah, talking about our the identity of God's redeemed folks. We see it here in Galatians as those who are uh, adopted as children, sent the spirit. The, there's a profound declaration made about uh, who we are here. And it's because Christ came in the fullness of time. The Christian uh, tradition, we know we look backwards, receiving uh, what the prophets foretold, and we find their fulfillment in Christ. I, I want to focus this morning just on this first few verses that Amanda read for us from Isaiah 61, verse 10. It said, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. With my whole being shall I exalt God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He's covered me with a robe of righteousness, like a bridegroom decks himself with garland, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. There's this putting on of clothes. It's a pretty powerful thing. I'm curious, what are you wearing right now? Think about it for a moment. What do you have on? How does it make you feel? And what does it say about yourself as an expression of who you are, how you understand yourself in the world? I'm curious, are you wearing something different now than you would typically wear on a work day? Or perhaps if we had church together in person, does it make you feel comfortable what you have on now or perhaps formal? I'm kind of in between. I have a tie on, which is pretty formal, and I have a sweater, which I love. It's very comfortable. I like to wear around. But what we wear, what we clothe ourselves is, says a lot about us. It's a signal of position, authority, of personality, and even of status. You know, we can let me share some slides with you here. Yeah, there's, uh, let me pull these up. Yeah, like mail carriers, we know that signals uh, image of who they are, what they're entrusted, the responsibilities they're entrusted with, uh, and the authority that they exercise. When you think of other folks like firefighters, you know, here we, we see them, we could pick them out right away and you see them on the street, you know, from their uniform. Uh, all kind of things. Also, um, we could think of even the pizza delivery guy has a uniform 
and we know what type of responsibilities he has and which ones he doesn't. Justices wear a certain outfit, don't they? Sometimes it's not just a profession, but it's a special occasion. Like here, a graduation from high school, you dress up. And academics has this uh, tradition where each step along the way, the outfits take on different meaning for there's a bachelor's uh, degree, or they can get pretty complicated with higher degrees, masters and PhDs and different schools represented. Some of you have participated in this kind of ceremony, a white, gown, a white coat ceremony. This is when uh, students uh, begin to actually, uh, under uh, their years of study, uh, become doctors, student doctors. You see that happening. I know some of you have participated in that for doctors and dentists and pharmacists even all participate in these type of things. And of course, on wedding days, we dress up, don't we? That's as our son, Nick, and his wife, Laura, and our family just a couple of years ago. Yeah, we do dress up. Clothes tell us a lot about ourselves. They tell the world a lot about who we are. And when we put them on, they make different statements about us. Oh, you know, I, I, I did end that prematurely because, you know, there's sometimes Sometimes we, we dress up in certain ways just for fun, like good Dan Norton here in his reindeer outfit for Christmas. That's pretty fun, huh? Yeah. Well, in all these kind of ways, our clothing makes a big difference. I'm not so sure that it makes the man, as they used to say, but it does shape our mindset. I remember as a kid, junior high school and then later in high school, getting ready for basketball games, lacing up my Converse All-Star leather high tops. Man, they, I, could, I can still smell, smell the leather and I can feel the squeak and hear the squeak of the new soles on the wooden floor. It put me in a mindset and excitement, ready to go play. There are some days now in this COVID time, I can go days without seeing people, but I'll still put on a tie and a coat to go to the office. It helps me remember what I'm about and be more productive and focused. So think about a moment, you know, when you have clothes make you feel relaxed or safe or focused or productive. You know, this passage from Isaiah 61 says, I will rejoice. It pulls forth joy with my whole being exult in God. Why? Because God has clothed me with the garments of salvation and covered me with a robe of righteousness. What does that mean? There are robes of righteousness, garments of salvation. You know, righteousness uh, in the Old Testament, as Jude and Hebrews have that, has two major different meanings. One is a legal declaration. It's a statement. It's a that, that somebody is in proper standing before the requirements of the law. They're in proper relationship to the law and even vis-a-vis uh, -vis their opponent or the one who's accusing them. They stand in the right, the righteous. The second one that is used is covenantal. Not so much the requirements of the law, but the obligations and the conditions of the covenant. And in this case, the covenant that God makes with his people. And keeping the covenant requires that both God continues to act for the deliverance of his people as he promised that he would, and that his people are faithful in keeping the requirements of the law, which lead to life. So God is declaring us by robing us in righteousness. He's declaring that there's a correctness, both in terms of a judicial judgment in front of the requirements of the law, we're declared righteous. There is no perversion or, or failure or twisting of the truth, but rather declared righteous. And in relationship to his covenant, God himself is righteous and that he keeps that covenant. Even at moments when we feel like he's inattentive or far away, God proves himself to be righteous to keep the promise of the covenant. A covenant he made with Adam and Eve that one day he would 
send the Redeemer to cover them over the covenant with Abraham and Sarah, that their family would be a blessing to the whole earth and to the promise he made to David that his kingdom would rule his line and his kingdom would know no end. So we are declared righteous, even though we know, just like in the history of Israel, they had a history of failing to keep the covenant over and over again, trying to meet the requirements of the law and yet not living up to it. Just like we pray every month with communion, we will next Sunday. We confess that we've sinned against God by not living up to what we should do, by failing to do what we ought and doing what we shouldn't, failing to love God with our whole hearts and our neighbors as ourself. We do fail over and over and over. The good news of Christmas isn't that, hey, look, you made the requirements after all. No, the good news is that God intervenes. God himself wraps his people in the robe of righteousness, in the garment of salvation. Uh, this, this imagery of putting a robe on someone, we see it other places in scripture. You know, we see God uh, even covering Adam and Eve in the garden when they were ashamed of their failure, ashamed of their nakedness. Uh, it's the first sacrifice recorded in scripture. An animal is killed, sacrifices its skin uh, to make coverings for Adam and Eve. Remember uh, Joseph in the Technicolor dream coat? His dad, Abram, uh, gave him special treatment as a favorite son. And it wasn't just a nice piece of clothing. It also said something profound about his identity in the family. Abram was saying, this is my son, Joseph, and I'm anchoring the family heritage on him. He will be my heir. All the rights of the household, all the goods of inheritance will come to him. Or think too, and this is probably closest to our situation, the prodigal son. He's in his squandered his family's wealth. He's insulted his father's name. Uh, and yet he's ruined uh, himself, come to ruin. He's found himself hopeless and helpless. And so he returns home not to claim the privilege of a son, but rather to beg for the position of a servant. But what does a father do? He runs to meet him. The son starts to beg forgiveness, but the father interrupts. And his first words are, quick, he says to the servants, go and bring the best robe and put it on him. What does that mean? It means I am fully embracing this lost child, this one that was dead to me. I'm embracing them now as my own, a full member, full participant in the household, a full child with all the rights and privileges of that child relationship. For what was dead is alive again, and the one that was lost is now found. You'll notice too, about these passages that God is the one that does the robing. He does the putting on. Remember a few weeks ago, it was the third week of Advent, Joy Sunday, and we read that passage also from Isaiah 61, but further up in the chapter than today's uh, passage. It's a passage that Jesus quoted, took it up for himself and called, claimed its fulfillment through his ministry so the spirit of the, of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me, sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to captives and release the prisoners. It's a day of vengeance of our God and comfort to all of those who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion. With how? What does he do it? He says he gives them a garland for ashes and oil for gladness. Uh, instead of mourning, in a mantle of praise or a stole of praise instead of a faint spirit. Notice how God layers these things on a garland or like a, I picture like a flower lay placed over one and oil for their head and hair and a mantle, a stole 
a sash around their neck of praise. It's a beautiful image. Can you see yourself in that as one who has had good news preached to them? Think for a moment with me, if you will. What are those things that break your heart and disappoint you, create frustration? What are those things that cause sorrow in you, your personal losses, of friends or family or positions of the world, the ways you want hope and peace, joy to reign, but where we look, it's broken, disappointed. Let's see yourself as one who has good news preached to them, receiving these gifts from God, like a loving father adorning you with a robe about your shoulders, anointing your head with oil, laying a sash over your shoulders that says, this is my child, my love. We like to dress ourselves, don't we? Put clothes on ourselves. In fact, you know, we think of having to be dressed by someone else as, well, that's only for children who aren't old enough to do it on their own, or perhaps of somebody who's suffered uh, some limitations so that they need help, or perhaps the stuffy royal folks who uh, need help putting their clothes on. But we don't take pride in being dressed by another. But here in this passage, we're invited to see our identity, our status, our place in life as being one who is clothed by God. And when we look back and read Isaiah through the lens of Jesus, his interpretation of that very chapter, we see that the garments of salvation, those are the benefits that are ours through Christ. Salvation is to be declared right, to be made right before God and the world through the work of the person of Jesus. This is an a, a image that uh, folks, Christians throughout the centuries have taken comfort in, that our identity and our blessing, our belonging to God is a gift entirely through being created in his image and then being brought back and clothed with Christ's righteousness. We would do well to think more about that. It, it became, uh, we can find it, evidence of it made popular in um, uh, Christian hymns. Let me share some of these with you. This one you might know, the solid rock this is the third verse, I believe. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, they may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Standing before God's throne, not pleading our own case, but dressed in the righteousness of Christ. Or this one, and can it be? And no condemnation now I dread, Jesus and all, and him is mine alive in him, the living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown. And that's a beautiful image, isn't it? You know, this uh, thing we sometimes can forget about, the benefits that are ours in Christ, and rather want to think of things that we deserve or earn or can do on our own. But that's not the point. It's the clothes that we're wrapped in. Well, you might say, if you're thinking carefully about this, well, Greg, is that really true? I mean, just putting a set of clothes on, isn't that just kind of cosmetic? Can't you just dress up and pretend to be something else? Does it really make a difference in who you are? We can do things like, you know, wear stuff, but really, a fool, you can dress up a scoundrel or a fool in a nice expensive suit, but they're still just a scoundrel and a fool, right? Jesus even warned about this in Mark chapter 12. Jesus said, watch out for those teachers of the law, those who walk around in their flowing robes so that they could be greeted with respect in the marketplace and have the most important seats in the synagogue. And yet they devour the widow's houses and for show make lengthy prayers. Men like this will be punished most severely. Well, we can put on things to fake it, 
clothes or even a fake smile. We can attempt to appear to be something other than we are. Have you, have you ever had this experience? You see somebody's picture on Facebook and you have to study it again and think, is that really them? Wow, I've never seen them look so good. How is that possible? We can do that, can't we? Doctor things up a little bit to appear better than we are. You know, Jesus cautions. Don't be like those teachers of the law, but notice this. In that passage, those ones who are covering themselves, they do the dressing. They put on stuff in order to appear differently. Whereas in our passage, strength and, and encouragement and confidence comes from God who does the dressing. You know, theologians have argued about this, what these robes of righteousness do. Do they change us or do they just cover us up? Is it the case that God is righteous and he just says that we're righteous because he can say what he wants? Or does it mean that we ourselves really are changed to become righteous? Is it just a garment covering over us? Or is it something that transforms us? The theologians, Augustine had this notion that uh, the, the righteousness of God is imparted to us. It, train, it transforms us, becomes our own righteousness. And about a thousand years later, Martin Luther said, no, it's just imputed. It's just a legal declaration with all the rights and privileges that come with that. But it doesn't change you. It's still a foreign righteousness, a righteousness that belongs to God, but you're just covering over. So what's the answer? Does it just lie on us or does it transform us? Is it in Puted or is it imparted? Well, I think the answer is yes and yes. That God, on the basis of his righteousness, declares us righteous, makes us righteous. He places on us, as it were, a righteousness that belongs to him, covers over our failings. And it's also the case that living in those robes, appropriating them, letting them sink down into us. The external becomes an evidence of what's going on internally. It can be slow, it can be real, but nonetheless uh, slow going and with hiccups and sometimes setbacks. But nonetheless, it is true change, ontological change of our whole person. And so we see as we did in Galatians, it's not just our outer appearance, but it's an inner self and it says, because you are children, God sent his spirit, his son, to our hearts. And so we cry out, Abba, Father, no longer a slave, but a child through and through. Because we are clothed by God, then we're exhorted to take that on, to put it on. Let me share with you a couple of New Testament scriptures oh, I got it. about this. We see here in, in the... First Peter 5, in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves, all of you, clothe yourself with humility towards one another, because God opposes the proud. Put on humility, clothe yourself with this. Or we see in Romans 13, you know, don't let us behave decently, as in the daytime, not carousing, and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality, debauchery, not in derision or jealousy, but rather clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and did not think about how to gratify the desires of your flesh. Put on this identity and this image. Or we see it here in Ephesians in these ways. He's talking about the contrast before and after. You know that the way of life you've learned, you've heard about in Christ and were taught in him accordance with the truth that was in Christ. And so as you were taught regarding your former life to put it off, set aside those old things which are being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and rather be made new in the attitude of your minds to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Or hear this beautiful one from Colossians again. Now rid yourself of things like these anger and malice, rage and slander and filthy language from your lips. Don't lie to each other. But as you have taken off the old self with its practices and put on a new self, it's being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Therefore, 
God, as God's chosen people, holy, dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, and bear with each other and forgive each other if anyone has a grievance against anyone, and forgive as the Lord forgave you. And above all these things, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So does God impute, declare us righteous? Yes, he does. And before any act of our own or any response of our own or any ability of our own wraps us in the garments of salvation and the robes of righteousness. And because that is so, says Paul, the preacher, as God's chosen people already holy and dearly loved, then you'll be active in clothing yourself with compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, and above all, love. Whoops, how about that? What did you get for Christmas this year? Well, a couple of years ago, our boys got us these silly outfits. <laughs> we got this for Christmas. See the elves and there I am, Chippendale Santa with a six pack. <laughs> ah, it matters what we put on, doesn't it? But let me ask you this. Anyways, what did you get for Christmas this year? You got this, a new set of clothes of righteousness, garments of salvation, a new identity as God's dearly beloved, declared righteous and being made righteous. And so let us resolve to put those things on, uh, to live into the clothes that he's already draped upon us. I invite you now to, to sing together our final hymn. Uh, which is while by their sheep. I think that's the name of it. Yeah. <laughs> Pray this blessing over each of us as we close our time together now. Friends, may the, the God who called us into being out of nothingness and who appointed this world for our comfort and for our care, and also who has appointed for us all we need, not just for life in this world, but for a life of godliness and of joy and righteousness. May we walk in the fullness of that and receive and appropriate to ourselves, take on, take up the Christmas gifts that are ours, new outfits of righteousness and salvation marked with humility and grace 
and patience and joy and humility so that we can more and more be made into the likeness of his son for his glory. Amen.